All right, everybody, we're going to be putting Ace out of commission for a bit, retool her for later, and we need a new companion for the Doctor. A few things to keep in mind, this will be a character that a bunch of different writers are going to be writing for, so we need somebody that can be summed up in a few broad strokes and has enough flexibility to work in a wide variety of science fiction stories, written under a wide variety of styles. But also someone who reflects the brand of the Virgin New Adventures, an adult who can handle adult situations, a character comfortable around subjects like sex, drugs, extreme violence, that sort of thing. A challenge, I know, but you're all very creative people. I'm sure you're up to it. All right, let's start with Ben Aronovich. Ben? Yeah, my character is Kadiatu Lethbridge-Stewart. She's from a tough cyberpunk future, a descendant of the Brigadier, who's very interested in her family legacy, and by extension, invested in the Doctor. She's super intelligent, she can keep up with the Doctor in matters of time travel, but also a really tough warrior type with complex personal motivations. Not bad, not bad. Maybe a little too tied to the series mythology, but I love her independence. I'll definitely consider it. Okay, next up, Paul Cornell. Right, so her name is Professor Bernice Summerfield. She's an archaeologist from the future, kind of a free spirit who likes adventure, hanging out with space hippies, and going on intergalactic pub crawls. She's had a sad past, her family was destroyed by the Daleks, and her upbeat personality covers up her lifelong grief. She knows a lot about space history, so she can basically generate plots by going, Hey, Doctor, let's solve this mystery from this ancient alien civilization I know about. And she can keep up with the Doctor in terms of historical knowledge. Oh, fun! She sounds super fun and interesting. Wow, this is turning out great. I knew I could count on you guys. All right, uh, last we have Neil Penswick. Uh, show us what you got, Neil. Huh? You said you are going to submit a Doctor Who companion? I did? Oh, shit. Yeah, I did. Um, Neil? One second. Uh, oh, fuck. Um, uh, uh, William Blake! William Blake? Yeah. The poet? Yeah. I'll think about it, Neil. Well, that's how I imagine it happened anyway. This is The Pit by Neil Penswick. Well, it took a while, but we finally reached it. We finally reached a book that isn't that important. Putting aside questions of quality, the first 11 books in the Virgin New Adventures have contributed something to the overall series, from starting and running through storylines, to creating important parts of the Wilderness Years mythology, to helping develop the series' house style, or having some other historical value. Probably the most skippable book we've covered so far in terms of continuity was Nightshade, and that's still important because it was Mark Gatiss' first piece of Doctor Who writing. But not The Pit. The Pit doesn't continue any storylines, doesn't change the characters of the Doctor and Summerfield, doesn't add a whole lot to the mythos that stuck, though it really tries, it tries really hard. And the author is a one and done. He didn't write any other books for the series or any other books, period. That, of course, is not a comment on the book's actual quality. Here's a comment on the book's actual quality. It's pretty bad. I know I'm burying the lead here, but I think we need to address this book's failings up front, just so we can get a grasp of what even happens in it. The story here is confusing, obfuscated by ambitions that far outweigh ability. The trick is to get on the book's wavelength. There's a lot of ideas here that suggest a certain depth of theme that first makes you think this is some kind of puzzle box narrative you have to solve, but in truth, it's just shit. So let's break it down. The Pit, not to be confused with the creature from the pit, or the Satan Pit, man, Doctor Who really loves holes in the ground, involves the mysterious disappearance of the Seven Planets, the most uncreative name for a star system in the whole universe. This happened 50 years before Bernice Summerfield was born, and she's always wondered what happened. What are the Seven Planets? The Doctor had walked in, having washed his face. She had managed to interest the Doctor in her suggestion. Anything to escape from the TARDIS. There was something disturbing about it. Not quite right. Fifty years from my time, an entire solar system was destroyed, Bernice said. I've always wondered what happened. Some say that it was a meteorite. 
Others say it was a terrible civil war. Okay, right off the bat, we're seeing some amateur writing decisions. The sentence, she had managed to interest the doctor in her suggestion, is redundant as it immediately followed the doctor expressing his interest through dialogue. You've heard of showing, not telling. Well, this is showing and then telling you again to make sure you got it. That's followed by a vague bit about Benny being uncomfortable in the TARDIS, but lazily the book doesn't express what that is. Come on, the TARDIS is weird. It's compressed and expansive at the same time. It's infinite claustrophobia. Either get creative or don't waste my time. Finally, a meteorite? A meteorite destroying an entire solar system? Was it paid overtime? You're smarter than that, Benny. I mean, this is barely a paragraph, and it serves as a pretty accurate vertical slice of the entire book. Redundant amateur writing, obnoxiously vague descriptions, and poorly thought out logic and science. Anyway, Benny wants to know what happened to the seven planets, and the doctor's curious because he's never heard of them, which is rare for him. So off they go to the 2400s. The Seven Planets is a very isolated colony spread out over six planets, with the Seventh Planet, a large jungle world, being declared off-limits by space government for some mysterious reason. Not that that stopped a scientist named Jirak and his wife Elle from illegally landing on the planet to perform experiments. They're not there long before some kind of red weed starts to overrun the area, freezing whatever it touches in time. Jarek is killed and Elle is left a crying mess, trapped in their space shuttle. Her husband had died, but they must have something which would bring him back. There must be something that could help. A shot of atrophine, the kiss of life, a bandage. She knew this was irrational. Tears rolled down her cheeks and she found her movements clumsy and difficult. Where is the clearing, goddamn you? Why is it taking so long to get back? Keep this in mind, she's panicky and not acting wisely, which is understandable at this point. It won't be understandable later. Also, where is the clearing doesn't have a question mark. The book might not have been checked for spelling and grammar. At the same time, two shape-shifting monsters named Butler and Swarf have arrived to the planet having stolen a bomb. Not just any bomb, but a super duper death bomb, the most powerful bomb in history, and it's called Pandora's Box. Cool mythology reference, bro. To help them move the bomb to some unknown destination, the two shapeshifters have enslaved a handful of Kothians, some native aliens that have limited telepathic ability and basically look like Harry Potter house elves. The two shapeshifters are particularly mean to one named Chopra, leading to this moment. Butler also smiled and threw Chopra to the ground. Chopra sank to his knees, coughing and gasping for breath. Would you like to see some real magic? Butler asked. Chopper looked up as he heard the sound of cracking bones. It wasn't an illusion. The dwarf was changing shape. His face was elongating, narrowing around the mouth and thickening on the forehead. Bulbous horns were growing out of his face. Thick brown hair was breaking out on the surface of his body. His clothes ripped as the dwarf grew to a three meter giant. Teeth protruded from the skin around his mouth. Hooves erupted in place of his hands and feet, a scaly tail grew out of the base of his back, and the creature fell on all fours. This was a Chakras, which had once roamed the planet Zabo, attacking and butchering the first colonists. Its foul breath polluted the air, its hide stank, and it moved closer to lick Chakras' face. He felt sick and retched over the ground. The apparition stood in front of them. Breathing, stinking, perspiring. The shape changers enjoyed terrifying weaker life forms. Chopra felt frightened. The shape changers did not understand. They were blind to the true purpose of their deeds. Butler raised its front legs into the air, halting its hooves before they stamped down on Chopra's body. It roared deep into the jungle, a howling animal cry. So, this moment happens at the end of a chapter, and I want to ask you. What exactly is it communicating? If you said, Butler just killed Chopra, I wouldn't blame you. Butler turned into a giant alien bull monster and just crushed all of that body weight onto a frail old man the size of a toddler. Chopra has to be dead. But no. Next time we turn to the shapeshifter plotline, Chopra is alive, seemingly unharmed by Butler's assault, and this incident is never referenced again. The only thing this scene successfully accomplishes is demonstrating Butler's shapeshifting abilities, but you can do that without the confusing prose. 
When you read this and discover Chopra okay later on, your first instinct is to wonder if something happened. Wonder what in the plot has allowed this to happen. There has to be a reason. Then you go back and reread the passage because maybe you misunderstood what was going on. You question your own intelligence. Finally, you realize that the book is just badly written, but not after making a journey to Mordor and back in your mind to try and work out what the hell is going on. Oh god, we've barely scratched the surface. Okay, so the Seven Planets government clearly need to stop the bomb from going off. So they send a squad of four androids. But not like cool killer androids, but rather organic Blade Runner replicant style androids. Androids that look exactly like humans, talk like humans, react like humans, are as frail as humans. Androids that have feelings, develop emotional connections to each other, flirt and joke around, get scared, have human names like Thomas and Marilyn, say shit, spelled exactly like that. Basically, human beings that the book calls androids to make it more sci-fi. The four killer-type androids had reputations among the Justice Police for ruthlessly carrying out their program tasks. They had been hand-picked for the one-way journey. Getting nervous? Marilyn asked. Yes, Thomas replied. They must know we'd come after them. Her eyes were staring at him. He tried to look away, but was forced to keep on sneaking a glance to see if her gaze had altered. So you handpicked killer androids that get nervous and throw I've got a crush in you eyes at each other. Why send in these losers and not just four actual human marines? There's some lip service about the planet being off limits to all humans, but this is a suicide mission no matter what. There's this thing where they have to keep eyes on each other at all time because they have to assume any life form they come across is the shapeshifters trying to trick them. That would be a reason to have androids if they were capable of identifying themselves as androids, like they gave off radio waves that the others could detect. But no, no dice. If they get split up and meet again, they have to assume the others are shapeshifters and kill them. These guys are useless. The only reason to have androids like this is if you're trying to drive home a metaphor of the slavery of capitalism that turns humanity into a commodity, or a bicentennial man thing about machines attempting to ascend to humanity. Now, there actually is a reason for human-like androids in this book, but it's a dumb reason, and I'll get to it later. So there's enough story there, right? A solar system that vanished, a mysterious jungle planet, a woman trapped by red weeds that stopped time, shape-shifting criminals moving a massive bomb with a bunch of telepathic slaves to an undisclosed location, an android special task force set to stop them. We're ready to get this plot rolling. <laughs> this is only a third of the plot threads we need to set up. Did you want a police procedural in the middle of all this? Well, too bad you're getting a police procedural. There's a lot of strife and conflict on the other six planets. A civil war is about to break loose. And to put a cherry on top of the shit Sunday, there's a serial killer going around killing young women. Major John Carlson is on the case. Uh, sorta. But keeps getting sidetracked. Like trying to find his wife in the middle of all this violence. Carlson answers to a man named General Copion who is trying to deal with a thousand crises at once. Copian stood in the corner of the room, in darkness. He was a military man, with a shock of white hair, a small beard around his mouth, and an aristocratic ponytail. He had only one arm, gold teeth, and a large facial wound, all scars of battle. Tiredness seemed to hang around him, as if the present conflict was too much of a burden for him. Yeah, I'm glad they clarified that the beard was around his mouth. I might have confused it for the beard around his ass. And what do you mean, as if the present conflict was too much of a burden on him? That's exactly what's going on. As if is a conjunction meant to lead into a descriptor of how things seem to be, not how things are. The room looked as if a bomb had gone off in it, not the room looked as if its occupant hadn't cleaned it in a while. This murder mystery plot, which has very little investigation and is mostly a bunch of space bureaucrats sitting around talking, runs parallel with a story involving a dealer in Earth Antiques named Bulber Sang Man, who comes across one of the murder sites and steals a valuable book from it, a book of poetry by William Ashbless. Cool obscure literary reference, bro. And this puts Man on the suspect list. It turns out that the book he stole wasn't really a book, but a hiding place for drugs, a space drug called Dream B, which isn't really all that different from cocaine, but it's alien in origin, so it has to be like 
super cocaine. All right, all right. So Benny and the doctor land on the jungle planet and the TARDIS is acting up. It won't take off again. The doctor's all, huh, there must be something on this planet causing problems. So they wander out into the jungle and get separated. Benny ends up with Spike, one of the androids who suffered internal injuries and is slowly dying. Spike is convinced Benny is one of the shapeshifters and wants her to lead him to the other one and Pandora's box, which involves a lot of river rafting. And where did the doctor go? He fell through a dimensional portal. A dimensional portal that had nothing to do with any of the stuff I just talked about. A dimensional portal that was not established, not hinted at, just popped up out of nowhere and the doctor unceremoniously fell through it. Okay, fine. What's on the other side? A hell dimension, where pig people take prisoners and force them to fight evil monkeys in cage matches, and blue tribal people flying around in- uh, okay, those are straight up Navi. Those are Navi. Is there anything James Cameron didn't rip off? Oh, and the doctor is sharing a cage with, uh, um, 19th century poet William Blake. Okay, okay, I think we need a Saved by the Bell Zach Morris timeout here. Something's up with this book, and I think we need to go to the source. Neil Penswick was born, of that we know, when and where I cannot say. What I do know is that, around 1988, Penswick was working as a social worker in Bedford when he submitted a Doctor Who script to Andrew Cartmel. It was a three-part script called Hostage. It was about an elite group of soldiers sent after shape-changing criminals Butler and Swarf, who had stolen a new weapon and taken it to an overgrown jungle planet. The end of the first episode was Swarf changing in full view into a monster, before it went to hunt in the second episode. It was Doctor Who meets Predator and Aliens. Yeah, Penswick was clearly sitting on the story for some time. This is why the androids in the book are exactly like humans. When it comes to robots, Classic Who would do one of two things. Either they would be androids that look exactly like people, or they would be stylistic but stiff and very limited in what they could do. The one time the show tried for an expressive android, it was kind of a nightmare. So Penswick opted for the first option in his script, but stuck with it for the book despite it being so dumb. Reportedly, Carmel liked the script, despite the high budget it would take to produce, but it never happened. Doctor Who was cancelled, but Penswick and Carmel kept in touch, and while Carmel was busy with Casualty, he became Penswick's sponsor for the Radio Times Drama Awards in the early 90s. The script Penswick submitted to the contest was called Children of the Morning. This was another very visual piece about a murder investigation in the Sikh community. Although I like Inspector Morse, television conventions on murder mysteries are still based around white middle-class stereotypes. Oh, okay. I guess Penswick sat on that one too. It was around this time that Virgin announced they were looking for writers for their new Doctor Who books, and Penswick sent Peter Darwell Evans the entire script for Hostage. There was a lot of back and forth, sample chapters were written, Penswick kept adding things like the murder mystery stuff from Children of the Morning. The original title of the book was O oh Lucifer, Son of the Morning, which nobody could have thought was a good idea. And then Penswick pitched William Blake as a new Doctor Who companion. I'll get into why this was a bad idea in a moment, but I want to go back to this interview Penswick did for the Doctor Who fanzine broadsword. Guys, Penswick really wanted to show you how well read he was. Originally, the pit was written like an Elmer Leonard or an Ed McBain. Hardly any description, lots of dialogue. It was much more stylish. Peter wasn't keen. The pit is about vision. The Manichaean struggle between the forces of good and evil. The book is full of allusions and passing references to the battle between these elemental forces. The book is about the shadow. The shadow is a Jungian concept, and outside of C.G. Jung, is best explained in Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces, which also details the quest structure found in the pit, and in Robert Thai's excellent little book The Human Shadow. Although I don't use it in the book, Nietzsche's If You Look Into the Abyss Long Enough, The Abyss Will Look Back At You is what happened to Copian. Yes, there was a lot of religious imagery. However, there was also a lot of Lovecraftian material. I think it was a shame that Virgin didn't try to unite the Lovecraft references so that they could have tied up the continuity. I once described the pit as the apocalypse now of Doctor Who novels, the journey up the river to confront a Jungian archetype. When I was in high school, I spent two summers going to a writer's camp at a college in Boise, Idaho. It was a ton of fun, met a lot of great people, learned a lot, but let me tell you, there were a lot of Penswicks there. Young, inexperienced writers who have read a lot of art and theory and thought they could get by with just that. 
My roommate wrote a story that referenced Nietzsche and the seven deadly sins, and it was deep, man. It's like how religion is bad and stuff. In reality, it was crap. Now, reading a lot of literature is great. It's necessary. Studying art and philosophy can expand your mind. But none of that is going to matter if you haven't grasped the fundamentals of basic storytelling. You're not going to be pulling off a nolly late flip if you don't know how to balance on a skateboard. Don't try to impress me by telling me how deep your book was after the fact. Write a good book to begin with. Now, I'm being a bit mean. This is a book review, not a character assassination, so let me say a few nice things about Penswick. His primary job was never as a writer, but working for Child Protection Services, which is a highly admirable career, and I applaud him for going out and helping people. He's occasionally worked as an advisor in soap programs on the subject of child abuse, making sure it's portrayed correctly, and bravo to that. By all accounts, he's a pretty admirable guy. Okay, with that out of the way, William Blake. There's an old saying from the days of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Don't reference a good movie in the middle of your bad movie. It just makes the viewer wish they were watching the good movie. I think the same can be applied here, because William Blake's introduction to the story just made me wish I was reading his poetry instead. William Blake, born 1757, died 1827, was a poet and illustrator who built a complex mythology that valued freedom. He challenged the doctrine of the church. He believed that Orthodox Christianity worked to suppress natural desires and discourage joy. He was opposed to slavery, he believed all races and genders should be equal, and that imagination trumped rationalism. Unfortunately, while I've done some extra reading for this review and really enjoy William Blake's works, I'm too much of an amateur to speak with any authority on what this book gets right about the man and what it gets wrong. Here's what I can say. If you thought this book might try to emulate Blake's poetry, you're out of luck. There's a reoccurring subgenre in Doctor Who where the Doctor and Companion meet up with an artist from the past and have an adventure that is in some way tied to their famous works. The Doctor and Rose meet Charles Dickens and face off against ghosts. The Doctor and Martha meet William Shakespeare and take on some witches. The Doctor and Donna meet Agatha Christie and solve a parlor mystery. The Doctor and Amy meet Vincent van Gogh and hunt down some unseen ailment. It makes sense to expect that, but it is an entirely new Who creation. The nearest classic Who got to that sort of thing was City of Death, which talked about the value of artistic authenticity in relation to the Mona Lisa, but Leonardo da Vinci doesn't actually show up in the story. If you're expecting Blake to go, oh, I'm going to put that into a poem or anything cute like that, sorry, ain't happening. If you're expecting a story that's reflective of Blake's mythology, sorry, not happening. Like most of the characters in this book, Blake is stiff and lifeless, invested in saving himself, but not much else. Except for a scene where Benny is having way too much fun river rafting, this book is pretty much joyless. Now, there is one moment I will contest as out of character for Blake, which is when he enters the TARDIS for the first time. This is near the end of the book, so the characters are all pretty exhausted from the evil they've been fighting, but still, Blake looked burnt out. The last week had taken a toll on the 50-year-old man. Bernice was not really aware of his poetry or art, but knew that he was a mystic and artist. She would have liked to have had a conversation with him, but he was exhausted. He walked into the TARDIS and didn't even notice that it was larger on the inside than on the outside. He leant against the wall and seemed to drain away. Reading Doctor Who through the lens of Blake is a long pastime for writers, especially in the essays of Philip Sandifer, as there are patterns to be found between the mythologies of Blake and the science fiction anarchy of the franchise. In Blake's mythology, Albion, the primeval man, fell and divided into four beings called Zoas, each representing an aspect of human perception, imagination, passion, sensation, and reason. And Urizen, the Zoa of reason, was the worst of them, using tools to constrain the universe within laws of science and enforcing uniformity onto mankind. Now the TARDIS, a large, impossible space within a small space, a device that can move freely through space and time, that's like a big middle finger to Urizen and his laws. And if anyone should be in awe at the TARDIS, should be giddy at its discovery, it should be William Blake. Finally, there's the matter of William Blake being proposed as a potential companion for the Doctor. I'm not sure if I'd call that creative or not. Having an actual historical figure as a companion would be a first, but since this is a real person, you don't have to bother coming up with an actual characterization for them. Truthfully, this would just be a limiting factor for other writers. 
Every single writer for the Virgin New Adventures after this point would have had to have started their book by doing research on William Blake and his writings, because if they get it wrong, you know they're going to get hate mail from poetry snobs. You can't be too creative with him. Companions are typically seen as the point of view characters for these stories. That's not universal, but typically how it works out. Which means everything then needs to be filtered through the perspective of William Blake. What does real life poet William Blake think about the Daleks? I mean, that's interesting, but highly limiting. There's no way you could sustain that for dozens of books. Bernice Summerfield and Katiatu Lethbridge Stewart were fresh faces that could be developed as the series went on. They had abilities and backgrounds that contributed to the narrative and could even generate stories on their own, like, you know, this one. But you didn't need to go to a college library to keep up. Obviously, I'm glad Virgin did not go in this direction. Wish they had done some other things, like maybe edit the book. So here's how all this fits together. The jungle planet is actually artificial, constructed by Copion, who is actually an ancient Gallifreyan general, to contain the Hell Dimension, which contains an evil force called the Yaskaroth, which are so generic and nondescript that later books retcon them into being just another name for the great vampires, which have existed in Doctor Who mythology since 1980. Penswick really wanted to leave some mark on the franchise. He wanted to choose the next companion. He wanted to create Gallifrey's dark secret. He wanted to create a Lovecraftian mythology that everyone should abide to. He wanted Copion to be the other from the Cartmel Master Plan. But none of it stuck. The shapeshifters are hired by a group called the Fellowship, an evil cult that worships the now great vampires. They want the bomb to open up a portal to this world and unleash their dark gods. This cult stretches back into Earth's history and we see the Doctor and Blake bounce around at different points in the cult's timeline, including Victorian England, where the cult is led by an evil albino. Yeah, good job there, guys. And they're responsible for Jack the Ripper, because why not? The shipshifters are into this plan because the Hell Dimension is where Dream B comes from, and that seems a bit extreme, like bumming a joint from Cthulhu. And they were hired by, okay, Jarek and L. Yes, the vacationing scientist couple were part of the Fellowship, despite never talking about it or acting like they were there for any reasons besides research, and despite Elle breaking down and not being in control even though she should be. She's a point of view character. We are privy to her thoughts, and her thoughts are not, all right, let's pop off this evil plan. So basically, the book lies to you. It says the character is one way, but is actually another way. That's bullshit. It's just, guys, th this book isn't important. Let's just, let's just go. We've all heard the expression, kill your darlings. It means be willing to let go of ideas if they're not working. Be able to walk away from a project, to eliminate the self-indulgences from your work for the sake of the reader. Neil Penswick doesn't kill his darlings. He cobbles them together into a Frankenstein's monster. All parts must be used, even if the result is a shambling mess. The pacing is bad, the style is bad, the grammar is bad. What the story shows and hides is all wrong. It juggles over a dozen plot threads that don't build on each other, but rather confuse and obfuscate. Descriptions are unimaginative, the mythology is self-important, the guest star is underutilized, scenes float pointlessly in the void, and occasionally the book just lies to you to keep its twists intact. In terms of the actual content, the actual plot, once you've managed to untangle it, and it took me three reads and a wiki page to really untangle it, it's not the worst thing in the world. The Doctor fights an evil cult. It's pretty simple. I mean, there isn't some offensive subject, not like the offensive sexism in Time Warp Genesis. It's just bad in terms of basics of storytelling. And let's not put all the blame on Penswick here. Editing clearly let this book down. It was almost certainly rushed out the door now that the series was releasing books monthly. If this is what happens when the Virgin New Adventures goes full steam ahead, perhaps we should be worried. Give this one a skip. It's not important for continuity, it's not important for mythology, and it's just not good. Next time, Peter Darrell Evans takes the reins and writes his own book for a change. Not one, but two fan-favorite characters make a return, and Darvel Evans finally lays down the law as to just what the Virgin New Adventures is supposed to be.